Yekaterinburg is Russia's fourth largest city. It's near the birthplace of former President Boris Yeltsin. And it's where the Imperial Romanov family was murdered in 1918. The passengers aboard the Tsar's gold train celebrate their arrival in Europe. Yekaterinburg lies right on the border between Europe and Asia. They've already traveled 8,000 kilometers from Beijing via the Mongolian Manchurian grassland and the city of Ulaanbaatar, past Lake Baikal and the Siberian cities of Irkutsk and Novosibirsk, 10 days and nights until they arrived here in Yekaterinburg. The compartments are not big, but they're certainly plush, a leftover from the Soviet era when only high-ranking party officials were allowed to travel on it. Now Petra and Axel Pott from Hamburg are enjoying this modest luxury. They've already seen a lot in their journey, and they're happy to call the train home for now. You get used to the small bed, even though I'm 1 meter 90 and can only sleep in one position, I don't mind. The train doesn't offer four or five star luxury, but it's comfortable enough. You shouldn't expect anything on a journey like this. After two days you're used to it, and you sleep well. You joke about how when you're headed down the hallway to the restaurant car the whole train sways, but it's fun. There are a lot of different nationalities on board the train. <laughs> this is my first trip by train, actually. I heard a lot about the call uh, Trans uh, Trans-Siberian route. It's kind of a fulfillment of my dream. The Trans-Siberian is world famous, but you won't meet many Russians on board. We travel through Russia on most of the route, but there aren't a lot of Russians here. The Trans-Siberian Railway has a different meaning for them. It's called Siberia's lifeline, but more in the sense that it's simply a form of transportation. The Trans-Siberian train links Moscow and Vladivostok in Russia's Far East. It was built in the late 19th century to transport wood, ore, and other resources from industrially underdeveloped Siberia into the West. It was built bit by bit and completed in 1916. The route stretches over eight different time zones. Often, tour guide Dietmar Ebert has to remind the passengers to adjust their watches and clocks. We'll be passing through two time zones tonight, so please remember to turn back your clocks by two hours. Traveling west on the Trans-Siberian train, passengers gain six hours. That doesn't sound like much, but jet lag is inevitable. There's certainly a lot of time to enjoy the journey, but why travel all this distance by train when flying would be much faster? You miss so much when you're on a plane and you don't get to interact with the culture quite as much. The train seems the way where you can be as close to the culture as possible, as close to the people in each place and still see as much as possible. This is Kazan, the capital of the Autonomous Republic of Tatarstan. For centuries, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Tatars and Russians have lived here peacefully side by side, as the city's impressive architecture shows. In the afternoon, young students from Kazan's music school give a surprise concert for the passengers. The school is famous throughout Russia and has produced some world-class talents. High culture meets down-to-earth Russian food. The train's three restaurants serve a lot of fish, but also meat, potatoes, and vegetables. The atmosphere is quite laid back. It's great. You don't have to worry about a thing. Everything runs smoothly. It's so well organized. I think we'll take a lot of wonderful memories home with us, and we've met some great people. It was worth it. The last leg of the journey is across central Russia. After 10,000 kilometers, the train reaches its final destination. Here, passengers can enjoy the sights of the Russian capital, Moscow. <laughs> 